people joining to watch it from all over the nation, which is amazing. We're super excited to have you all here as we transition into the Q&A portion of our event tonight. I wanted to reintroduce myself and also reintroduce our panel. I want to remind you all to ask people questions, joining to watch it from Q&A, all so over the nation, which is amazing, the chat on YouTube, or you can feel free to post your questions onto YouTube or onto Twitter with the hashtag current revolution. Um, my name is Alexis Miller. I'm an engagement specialist at Solar United Neighbors. We have Paul Hurt with us, who's a professor and senior sustainability scholar at Arizona State University. We have Anya Schoolman, who's the executive director and founder of Solar United Neighbors, and Corey Ramson, who's the VP of Go Solar Programs at Solar United Neighbors. Um, so as I said, reminder to ask your questions in the chat feature of YouTube, as well as post them on Twitter with the hashtag current revolution. Um, maybe Super to excited. kick it off with folks, could we have each of you panelists introduce yourself and give a brief background and maybe a thought or two from watching the movie? Paul, it looks like you're ready to get started. Okay. <laughs> Yes, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for showing the film. It was a pleasure being involved in it. Me um, too. You can probably you can... tell from my face that I was uh, one of the talking heads in that documentary. Uh, I just met the filmmaker Roger Sorkin at ASU a couple of years ago when he was there doing um, interviews and uh, spent about two hours in an office uh, talking with him. And now I serve on Roger's advisory committee and I'm working with him on a second documentary film that should be out, um, well, it was gonna be out the this summer, but coronavirus has Ramson, the uh, pushed things back a bit. But it's gonna focus on um, a concept called just transitions. This was something that was in the film itself that uh, there's gonna be a lot of disruption from the renewable energy revolution. We all want it to come and we want it to come quickly. Um, but at the same time, we have to look at the businesses and the workers and the communities that will be affected by this dramatic uh, downturn in the uh, in the coal industry and uh, dramatic upturn in yes, the thanks renewable for the energy invitation. industry and so just transitions is an effort to try to think about how we as a society can work together to facilitate the transition to clean energy in a way that is less wrenching for uh, say coal fired uh, power plant communities or coal mine communities that leaves uh, fewer uh, collateral damage in our wake and brings everybody along in this um, wonderful revolution that we're in the midst of. And this doesn't happen very often. I'm a historian and I, my last book was a history of the electric Things power back system, a bit, in the but US, it's going to focus in British Columbia. And I covered a hundred years of history and really the technology hasn't changed all that much, just incremental improvements. The changes that we're going through right now in our energy system are, more rapid and more transformational, more profound than any other single period of transition in our energy history going back 120 years. It's remarkable that we're alive and uh, participating in this. Awesome, thank you so much, Paul. Anya, would you like to introduce yourself? I have to remember to unmute myself. Um, thank you so much. Um, and thank everyone for joining us. I know these are tough and concerning times and it's really uh, warms my heart to be able to get together with a whole bunch of people that care about energy and distract myself from the, the virus. So thank you so much for joining and thank you, Paul, especially for joining us as well. Um, it was my first time seeing the movie. I uh, was really, thought it was really fascinating. And I, um, I really like the way the movie brought up sort of the um, the twin issues of utility ownership and people ownership and different uh, sort of lines of thinking, which I think in some way sometimes are very much clashing, which is whether this transition is going to be really driven by big business and utilities changing and becoming owners and developers of renewable energy or whether it's going to be the people and lots of companies and a very distributed uh, ownership model. And I, I think that I'm sure in the long run it'll be both, but I thought that the tension and the, um, 
the different ways of thinking about that were really well illustrated in the movie. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people have to say and what their questions are. So thank you so much. Thanks, Anya. And yeah, we're getting some great questions. So keep them coming. Corey, we'll have you introduce yourself and then we'll dig into some of the questions. Sounds great. Um, so I'm Corey Ramston. I'm the vice president for Go Solar Programs for Solar United Neighbors. And my job, I think, is a pretty fun one. I get to help folks in all the states where we work and all across the country go solar, which means we're helping provide practical resources for people who need it, uh, who want to make this uh, transition to clean energy and are willing to uh, to embark upon that. And so it's a very gratifying for me. I'm a solar owner myself. In 2012, I installed solar on my house and uh, came to this industry sort of mid-career, uh, somebody who was in IT for 15 years and have uh, slowly worked my way into this uh, field. So I've sort of had a variety of perspectives on how people end up connected to solar and uh, in this work as well, I have. In particular, I think some things that stand out for me, uh, having worked for Slow United Neighbors for five years, both on the ground in Maryland as a program director and in this current role is just seeing how eager people are to interact with, with solar energy, both not only as people who want to invest in and participate but also to advocate in their own interests. And I'll, I'll give one sort of brief example, which I think reinforces a lot of what I saw in the movie is it really only takes a few people who are willing to stand up in certain mom key moments to really make a difference. We want as many people to do it as possible, but I've seen even a single individual show up at a public service commission meeting state their case as somebody who is being represented by those commissioners and make a difference have them listen to that person and have a, a policy actually be changed because of them participating so that's why i come to work every day and uh, helping people directly is uh, what makes my job great and looking forward to hearing people's questions thanks corey and thank you all for being a part of the panel thanks for asking your questions we'll start digging into those First of all, Paul, we got a comment from Kevin that your house looks unique and beautiful. So love the view you're giving us there. Um, we have a question from Mark who said, did the U.S. invent solar um, or wind? And I know, Paul, you're a historian in this stuff. So maybe you have some insight to add about that. Got to remember to turn my microphone back on because we, we muted in between talking. Um, uh, solar's been around a really, really long time. In fact, Arizona State University itself is one of the oldest solar research programs in the country, uh, dating back all the way to the 1960s, early 1960s. We had solar energy um, uh, in our in NASA and our space program going back to the 1950s. Uh, if you think about it, every single satellite up in space, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them, are all run on solar panels. Um, so the technology has been here for a very, very, very long time. It's just been so expensive that the only people who could afford it were the Department of Defense and uh, NASA. Um, but uh, as we've gotten into um, uh, mass production, you know, you build more of something and the per unit cost comes down, just like cell phones happened uh, 20 years ago. Um, mass production has led to a tremendous decline in the cost of uh, solar panels. And uh, a lot of that production actually has moved outside the U.S. Most of the production of solar panels is, it's global now, but uh, much of it is in Asia, particularly in South Korea and Japan and China. Um, and so, you know, most of our economies are global now. The United States has played a significant role uh, from the very beginning, but uh, research and development and manufacturing have gone global and the U.S. is no longer uh, the, the leader that it might have claimed that it was 50 years ago. Thanks, Paul. We have another question here um, that says, given that utilities can actually profit from distributed energy resources, what are the greatest barriers to them adopting it proactively rather than resisting? Um, Anya or Corey, do either of you guys have thoughts on that? There, there, that is a very complicated question. Um, a lot of times the problem or the barrier is that utilities are not just utilities. Like what a utility is, is a, uh, a regulated monopoly that, that buys or distributes it and bills you. So it's the wires and the meters and the billing. That's the core of what a utility is. And if, it, if that's all it is, 
then the utility doesn't really have a vested interest one way or another. They're going to buy the best, cheapest, or most desirable kind of power. But what's happened in our country is that utilities have become giant holding companies that are vertically integrated that own generation, a lot of generation. They own nuclear power plants, coal power plants, and gas power plants. And they also make money building transmission. So they have a lot of money and vested interest in the current system. So the challenge is when you're asking them if they don't need new generation, you, they would have to close or phase out something that they already own. So it's a it's a conflict of interest fundamentally. That's the most simple explanation. It gets even more complicated when, for example, in many markets, you're saying to the utility, we don't necessarily want you to own it. We want you to do a competitive RFP or let there be competition or buy it on the wholesale market. And different states have different structures of how their markets are organized. Some are called regulated, some are called deregulated. I'm not going to go into all that today unless for the people that want to hang on. But each state, it depends on the nuances of how the market is structured. Along the lines of that, we got a question from Bobby in Minnesota who asked, the movie focused on investor-owned utilities. What about co-ops and municipal-owned utilities? What role are they playing and should they be playing in getting us more distributed solar? Uh, well, I'd love to um, hear Corey, but I'm gonna jump in um, simply because I got myself elected to our local public power utility, a municipal utility called Salt River Project four years ago. And um, there is a there is a difference between publicly owned utilities and for profit utilities that are regulated. And that is that the publicly owned utilities aren't paying shareholders and their first loyalty is not necessarily to investors and shareholders. It's to the people that they serve. And so they can make more innovative decisions if they want to, and they can um, make um, more sort of innovative investments in new technology. Now, a regulated for-profit utility, the way we've got it structured in our country and states regulate uh, for-profit utilities, the way it's structured is that those utilities get to earn a return on investment. And so the more they invest, the more return they get. So they have an incentive to invest in a lot of big infrastructure. And people who put solar on their own roofs to reduce their energy load, that's not an investment that the utility is making, so they can't earn a return on it. Plus they're getting less revenue from that customer because that customer is serving their own load from the sun. And so that's why for-profit utility largely hostile to rooftop solar unless they're forced by the regulatory commissions. That's one of the reasons we need regulatory commissions is to drive for-profit industries into a path that not only provides profit for them, but provides broader benefits for the public, for the social, so that we regulate for-profit utilities. Did I go off on a tangent there? Do you want to have a follow-up? No, thank you, Paul. Unless, Corey, do you have more to add on that? I would just say that uh, I think in the same category, there are um, uh, electric cooperatives where members are actually uh, organizing that entity is that they have a, a direct way to influence the decisions of that cooperative. And that's by voting for, uh, for representatives that uh, represent what their interests are or even running themselves. Uh, they have that power as a member. And a lot of folks who are part of electric cooperatives don't know that um, because of the way those cooperatives are run. Some are progressive, some aren't. But if you are an electric cooperative customer, I would highly recommend uh, thinking of yourself as a member and not a customer because it's you, you have control. That's great. Thank you, Corey. And Peter, actually, from Arizona, said he's got his ballot for the Salt River Project elections happening now. So note to you, Paul. Um, we Thank have you another. for voting, Peter. <laughs> we have another question. Corey, I'll throw it over to you, though. Anyone's welcome to jump in. Um, there's some discussion in the movie about using vehicles as a storage solution. Is there any significant development on that front within a utility in the U.S.? I 
I'd say there's a lot, this is a great question. Uh, there's a lot of development that's going on there. Uh, we at Solar United Neighbors don't track it as closely as we do solar developments, but I will give you a, at least one example that I'm aware of. Uh, and I think it points to some of what they shared in the movie about um, electric vehicles really being a resource for the grid, being able to provide not only transportation, but also services to the grid. Uh, and that's happening at a variety of levels, right? You've got individuals owning uh, vehicles who want to, who potentially could offer those services and be compensated, but you also have fleets of vehicles. You have commercial vehicles, you have um, municipal vehicles as well. Uh, one just concrete example of that is in Virginia, uh, I believe they are working with the uh, Dominion Power there to be able to have school buses uh, be electric school buses and provide those services. That's a great way to improve air quality, to provide services, and to enable a utility in this case to um, be able to proactively um, force that transition to electrify electrification of the vehicle fleet. So there's a lot of examples out there. I'm sure if you looked for them, that's just one. But uh, I think we will see over the next uh, year or two a significant number of those start to move forward as utilities and municipalities understand what the value is there. Yeah, can I jump in? There's an enormous opportunity here. I'm a happy owner of a Tesla Model 3, and I will never go back to an internal combustion engine. For anybody who hasn't test driven an electric car, um, please do it. It'll be transformative for you. Um, and also from the point of view of uh, being on the board of directors of a utility, the potential for energy storage that's represented in electric vehicles uh, by the time we have 10 or 15 percent of our vehicles electrified, we're going to have an amazing amount of storage and the ability to. So just the challenge that utilities face is to provide electricity during the peak demand period. They have to have all the generation resources they need to meet peak demand. Here in Arizona, that's basically a, a hot afternoon in the middle of July. Now, in March and November, there's not that much demand on the grid because people aren't running their air conditioners here in Arizona. But in June and July, everybody's got it cranked up to the max. And so SRP, Salt River Project, has to build generation resources to meet that peak load in late July on a hot summer day when it hits 115 or 120 degrees. The rest of the year, they've got assets sitting there unutilized. Now, storage will allow us to schedule charging of electric vehicles at times when there's lots of excess generation capacity. So all those times when they've got a crank down or they don't have anywhere to sell the solar energy from their solar farms, that can all be going into electric vehicles. And then during the hours in the up north, it's in the middle of the winter, down, down south, it's in the middle of the summer, those vehicles can be discharging during the three or four or five peak hours of energy demand and make it so that we don't have an additional gas fired power plant to ramp up during those to serve that peak demand. Solar plus battery serve peak demand and keep us from having to build new fossil fuel plants. It's an amazing opportunity and we're gonna see that unfolding over the next five to 10 years. I predict that here in the Southwest, no utility will build a single additional fossil fuel fired power plant in the next 10 years because solar plus storage has gotten cheaper than natural gas and natural gas is the cheapest fossil fuel uh, energy source there is and solar plus storage is now cheaper. So the transformation is here and we're gonna see a lot of change and electric vehicles are all part of it. Yeah, thank you, Paul. We're excited to be a part of that revolution. I have a question about more of how we can get solar for more folks. So from Esther, he said, going solar makes perfect sense for standalone homes. How do we approach folks who live in apartment complexes or dense urban areas? And Leah also said, has anyone seen a model of solar that works for condos? So Anya, Corey, do you guys have an answer to how we can approach that? Yeah, I can take that one. I think uh, the answer is it, there's a variety of things that can be done. It's not a single a single solution. I mean, I think we'll maybe um, I'll work on the first question there as far as uh, urban environments and sort of dense populations, folks who can't control their own roofs. Uh, there are a number of policies that are already in place for, um, in different places, parts of the country to do that. And I'll give you 
be a couple examples. Community solar is a type of solar where when it is um, enabled by legislation in many cases, will let an array that is somewhere else in that same area share their uh, the kilowatt hour production virtually on a credit for a bill for somebody who lives in an apartment complex, for example. And that's true whether they have their own bill or in some cases even a whole apartment building if it's a master meter or a single meter. So there's lots of op options there. Um, and in terms of sort of the density, I think you will find, and I live in Washington, D.C., so I've kind of a, maybe an example here is you're not always going to be able to cover all of your electricity from what's on your roof in those environments. But there are other options. If you combine things like community solar and energy efficiency to reduce your load, we find a lot of people who go solar, uh, after they do that, the next thing they've done, they do if they haven't already, is how do I make the most out of my investment? And they start looking at ways to conserve electricity because those kilowatt hours matter to them now. They're producing their electricity and it changes the conversation for them. So I think it's important to layer things together, not just rooftop, but uh, community solar, energy efficiency. These things all need to sort of complement each other. And as solution providers, both in the marketplace and also municipalities and folks who are helping people go solar in any context, it's important for us to sort of talk about that whole conversation because uh, ultimately, there are really good solutions that are out there in a lot of places now, and where they aren't, those are places for advocacy. Not everybody has community solar. Uh, not everybody has programs to provide access for low and moderate income individuals who uh, maybe can't afford, uh, finance the system on their own. These are opportunities still that, that we're still working through, but uh, there's a lot of good examples of where that's already happening. Thank you, Corey. That's great. Um, Paul, we have a question from Michael that said, how do you all feel about the Arizona Corporation Commission's sustainable standards that are coming? Since you're in Arizona, you might have some thoughts as well as Anya, if you want to add in, since Arizona is a state we've been working on that in for the past year. Uh, I've been paying more attention to um, what we're doing on sustainability at Salt River Project, being on their board of directors, than, than the ACC. So um, probably somebody uh, who's been working with the ACC would be uh, better to take that. But we are moving forward. I can say that. Um, uh, you know, some states uh, are moving backward. Arizona is moving forward. Uh, we finally have better corporation commissioners for a while. We had a corporation commission with five members. Uh, it's an elected. Um, it's an elected board, not an appointed board. And uh, the largest utility in the state, Arizona Public Service, uh, was funding their favored candidates using, um, you know, dark money, using these uh, um, uh, organizations where they don't have to uh, uh, disclose who their donors are. And so we had five commissioners who were all sort of in, in the pockets of the state's largest utility. And uh, they were at the time that utility was very much against rooftop solar. And uh, so we had a lot of bad policies for a long time, we stagnated. Um, after that period when Chris Mays, who was in the film, Current Revolution, lots of uh, good uh, shots of her talking. She was one of the uh, architects of, of our renewable energy standard uh, 15 years or so ago, but we have term limits. And so all the good people that were on the Corporation Commission back then when we adopted our renewable energy standards uh, had to cycle off. And it's taken a long time, it's taken about 10 years, but we finally have a couple of good people on now and uh, several more who are running in this year's election. And I'm hopeful that we can finally move the state forward again. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been a desert in many ways in terms of good solar policy in Arizona for a while, but things are moving forward. Thank I might just uh, tag on um, the, the ACC just made a, I think it's a staff recommendation to go to a hundred percent, which was a big surprise. Uh, and uh, it was very, very exciting news. Uh, and I, I think what our position is, is it's a great start and now we've got to make it real. We've got a long way to go to make sure that there's distributed solar, that it really turns into real projects on the ground. A paper standard is not going to work. And so going from a target to a program is a lot of work and we're just getting started. So I, I think we're really excited about this, you know, what Paul described, this new opening again in Arizona to make progress. Uh, and then I just also wanted to piggyback on Paul's comment about um, either commissions in the case of Arizona, or in many cases, it's legislatures that um, or if the governor appoints the commission, 
commissioners. It's very unusual to have elected commissioners the way they do in Arizona and many other states, they're appointed by the governor. And what we're finding over and over and over again is that the utility is essentially picking their own regulators. The term for it is, you know, is regulatory capture. I think that's the, uh, and what it means is they are in many of our states, I think actually in all of our states, the last time I looked, the single largest political donor in the state is either the utility or their sort of dark money surrogates. And so we're seeing it over and over again. And so a new reaction which is that just happened in Arizona, it's happened in Virginia in different forms, is ratepayers and co-op owners and people who are the people who are affected by the energy system are insisting that the utilities get out of the politics. They, if they're going to be a regulated monopoly, they can't also pick their regulators. And so in Virginia, what you saw uh, was um, most of the Democrats in the last election took a pledge not to take money from the from Dominion, from the utility there. And in Arizona, they made a ruling against um, the political contributions for elections in for the ACC. So I think we're making real progress in sort of democracy and accountability, but we have a lot of ways to go. And it's really going to come from people like you all who are demanding, uh, you know, clean elections and transparency and accountability. Thank you, Anya. The question here from Chris, and to be honest, I do not know this technology. So hoping some of you guys know about this. It says, do you see a path for V2G or V2H via Chad Demo? Corey, it looks like you know what I'm talking about. So do you see a path forward for that um, is what Chris is wondering about. I'll uh, maybe I'll, I'll start, and I'm sure uh, Paul probably has some opinions on this as well. Um, the I think the vehicle to grid really is is the idea there, which is that you're using um, this battery that is in a vehicle for alter other purposes when it's not being um, driven. And there are definitely some, I think, some real uh, possibilities there. The one of the the things to overcome, I think, from the manufacturer side is what are the limitations in terms of compromising the warranty for the battery in the vehicle as it's being, you know, for for the purpose of maintaining it for a. Uh, for uh, driving the vehicle. So that has to be worked through, but as a technology, there's no reason why that battery, when it's sitting at rest, can't be controlled and, and uh, coordinated with um, being able to provide services. I mean, the technology's there, it's really just figuring out how to do it at scale, uh, which we saw in the movie, is very similar type of question. Paul, what do you think about that? Yeah, Corey's exactly right. Um, I, I predict that we will see uh, progress in two pathways and we're first going to see progress in vehicle to grid um, with uh, public transit systems. Um, a lot of people are, a lot of counties and cities are shifting over to electrified transportation, buses, etc. In fact, last year 50% of all mass transit buses manufactured and sold worldwide were already electric. Uh, that's going to go fast and those will be the first vehicles that we'll probably see uh, integrated vehicle to grid integration. Um, Corey made a really important point. Um, the only thing that's standing in the way is concern about um, a vehicle's battery warranty and concern about charging and discharging on a daily basis uh, to support the grid will um, have the effect of perhaps uh, reducing the total range. Um, uh, or the effective charge capacity of that battery. And as long as we have range anxiety, as long as our electric vehicles are only getting 200, 250 miles, people are gonna be concerned about range anxiety and about the longevity of their battery. But one of the biggest sources of research and development in the energy field for the last five years has been lithium ion batteries and also solid state batteries. And we're gonna see a tremendous number of new battery technologies coming out and improvements in existing lithium ion batteries coming out. In fact, in April, Tesla is supposed to be holding a uh, battery and drivetrain investor day at their Buffalo Gigafactory. And um, most people who are on the inside are expecting Tesla to finally announce uh, that they have developed a new battery technology that will provide a million miles of range in their batteries. They already have a million mile motor and they've been working toward a million mile battery. At that point, 
range anxiety. And when everybody's getting 300, 350, 400 miles per charge in their car and they have a million mile battery, you can see that vehicle to grid um, concerns are, are just going to evaporate away. And I think within five years, uh, it'll be very commonplace. Great. Thank you, guys. Glad you guys knew that abbreviation better than me. Um, we have a question from Robert. He said, I know that GMP is doing some virtual power plant work in Vermont and subsidizing energy storage for homeowners. What does the panel think of this model? Can I do this one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can go to it, Anya. I, this is, I, these projects are fascinating to me because this is really from a, an organization like ours where we're trying to help individuals interact daily and benefit from participating in renewable energy and the distrib distributed energy resources, this is sort of the next step there, right? If you take solar and batteries uh, and you connect them together, individuals, like I've got one in my house and somebody else has one in theirs and they all start to talk to each other through a single entity, could be a private company, it could be like Green Mountain Power, like this forward thinking utility. If they're coordinating those resources, then you've got a virtual power plant, which is what a lot of people call it. And that's got a lot of value to the utility, which means that it should have value to me and I should be able to, to benefit from that. And these projects, like the one that um, was mentioned, these are really, uh, I think, the starting point for that. There's a number of, of pilots out there like that. There's uh, one, I think, that um, Sunrun is doing in Boston, uh, in the Massachusetts area, and there's a couple others on you might mention. Real potential for us to expand the conversation about what individuals and what distributed resources can do for the grid and how they can benefit. Can I add one thing? Sure. I, I agree with um, Corey completely. And one of the things that was so exciting this year was sort of the next thing beyond pilots, which is um, uh, this company, uh, projects in, I think is both Hawaii as well as the Bo uh, Boston market, where they bid into a competitive auction for power, where they're competing with conventional energy and the s distributed solar plus storage beat everything and won the auction. So it's it's beating it's winning in competitive markets. It's no longer a subsidized pilot idea or a demonstration project, but it's really going to the point of being able to be deployed. And we're just on the cusp of it. So so exciting. And if you just Google like virtual power plant, there's lots of great articles online about it. Yeah, I'll add something really quick. Um, this is going to be mass produced, uh, particularly in new development areas. There's a whole bunch of home developers, Meritage Homes is one of them, that are, are planning to build entire communities where every single house has solar, integrated solar and battery storage. And they're trying to cut deals or make uh, relationships or arrangements with local utilities to be for that whole community to be a virtual power plant so we're going to see in new home construction all over the country we're going to see a lot of VPP virtual power plants and then of course that's all accelerated by California's decision last year to require integrated solar and in every single new house being constructed in the state and I think as California goes so goes the nation eventually uh, we're going to see all new home construction having integrated solar and probably battery storage. And uh, this is really going to ramp up rapidly. It's trying to get that technology into our old neighborhoods and into the existing built environment that's going to be a little more complicated and a little more expensive. But we need to do that, too. We should be producing energy everywhere that we live and everywhere that the sun shines. I love that. Thanks, Paul. We have a question from Thomas that says, are new technologies available to protect linemen working on the grid from electricity flowing from residences? I can take um, that one. Um, the good news is it's not new technology and it's been around for a long time. Uh, there are um, engineering standards that all of the equipment, the brains of, a, of, of this equipment, which is the inverter, uh, that their rules that they're supposed to follow, uh, these are listed and uh, IEEE standards. And what that means is that w under those circumstances, that unit is gonna shut off and not produce power. 
how that happens is actually starting to change a little bit because we want those inverters to, to um, support the grid in the case of an outage in some situations. Uh, so their standards are actually being revised, but that standard has been around since 2003. And uh, when solar connects to the grid, it is playing nicely and shutting off and letting Lyman, uh, lines people work on the, the utility grid to fix it without danger to them. That's one of the conditions of connecting to produce solar is that they do that. Thanks, Corey. I appreciate the information. We have a question from Michael that says, what about CCE community um, choice energy as an option? Anya, can I grab you for that one? Um, I think that um, what he's referring to is like community choice aggregation, which is a, a policy approach. Uh, which may or may not be a technology. So what it is is a rule that I think there's at least 10, 15 states that allow it, which is kind of like an alternative to what the utility is offering. And it, let, it lets a group of people in some cases or a municipality in some cases to come together and say, well, rather than just buying what the utility is selling, we're going to all get together and make our own purchase plan for the energy that we use. And in some cases, that just means going to the wholesale market and buying different energy. And in some cases, it it, it means they're actually going to develop, uh, you know, renewable energy or become self-sufficient or something like that. So as I what I would say is as a tool, as a concept, it's a great idea. How it's implemented is it depends. It depends how it's done and it's implemented in all sorts of ways from exceedingly intricate to exceedingly not very meaningful. Um, there's as many permutations as there are projects of it. So it's, it's an avenue just like a lot of the others that came up in the movie and in this discussion for communities to take control of their energy and change the mix of energy that's coming into them. It's more of a market design model rather than a construction model. But as all of these are the sort of devils in the details in terms of you can't just wave your wand, say, now we're gonna do it and then hope that it works out. You gotta follow it all the way through and really understand what it is you're getting. And each, unfortunately, like so much in energy, each state is different. So what really works for, you know, California is not the same in Ohio, et cetera. Along those lines of each of the states being different, we have a question from Michael who says, what's the feasibility in extremely cold climates and how is storage accomplished there? I can take a shot at that. Um, so the, I, Storage, like any other, you know, resource uh, generation resource, is going to um, need to be um, situated in a way that it's able to produce in that environment. So, in cold climates, they're, you know, they're going to be, they're going to need to put it in places where it's protected and operate efficiently. The chemistries vary in terms of what those requirements are. A lead acid battery is going to need a different type of environment than a lithium ion battery, for example, which may be able to be outside. Um, in different conditions. So that's going to vary on the on the implementation. And the same thing is true for for solar, but there are plenty of places in the in the world from a solar production perspective that uh, get less solar than a lot of parts of the United States, like Germany, that have a vibrant and, and very um, effective solar energy production resource on rooftops all over the country. Uh, and the th same is true for storage, right? I like to say, um, we're a country of engineers and we're a country of people who know how to get things done. If our commitment is to do this, then we're going to figure out a way to do it. And we're going to make the right choices in the right places when the incentives and the reasons for doing it align with all of our desire to have it done. Uh, and this is just another example of that, right? There's there, These are engineering problems that we can solve when we need to. And in most cases, they're good solutions, uh, even without jumping through a lot of hoops. Yeah, I would, I would uh, just add to that we're really at the beginning stages of innovation in battery storage, and that's because it's been too expensive um, for uh, mass application. We've been using lithium ion batteries for, you know, 15, 20 years in many of our small devices, and those are small batteries, but, you know, a car 
has thousands of those batteries. And uh, it's, it's only recently, only in the last three to five years, that lithium ion battery technology has become so affordable that it can be it can be utilized in all kinds of energy storage, electric vehicles and energy storage applications that it simply was too expensive um, to utilize before. And so now we suddenly have an opportunity for a much wider, much more distributed use of that particular technology. And so we're seeing tremendous technological innovation. Nobody bothered spending money on lithium ion battery research when there were so few applications for it. But now everybody is. There's at least a half a dozen different lithium ion battery uh, chemistries that perform differently in different environments and for different purposes. Some lithium ion batteries um, will recycle a whole lot, but you can't charge them very fast. Other lithium ion battery chemistries can charge really fast, but they don't have as long a life. And so there's ways of tweaking the battery chemistry to design it for the specific use that you have. And you can design it to work better in hot climates or work better in cold climates. And we're gonna see all that kind of technological innovation now that, uh, now that batteries are affordable. And by the way, somebody in one of the questions was saying, where's all this, where's all these metals coming from? And you can only recycle about 40% of a battery. So I just wanna correct that if anybody else is scrolling through there. 100% of lithium ion batteries can be recycled. Lithium doesn't get spent. It's, there are other problems with how the battery functions that leads to um, the decline in, in, the, in the charging ability and, and the lifespan of that battery. But once that battery is no longer performing as you need it to perform, every single component in a lithium ion battery can be recycled into new batteries. And in many cases, there already are. The Tesla Gigafactory in Nevada, they already have a section of that manufacturing plant dedicated to recycling batteries. They're not getting very many of them back yet. And so there's not a whole lot of recycling going on because the technology is so new and those batteries tend to last for 10 or 15 years. But Tesla plans to recycle all the components in all of their batteries long-term and there's no reason we can't do that. Thank you, Paul. And I appreciate you picking up that question that worked out perfect with that. We have some more questions, it looks like, about vehicles, um, talking about, do you know, from Kevin, do you know which electric cars on the market today have the best cost per mile, and should we buy new or electric cars? Um, do you have any quick thoughts on that? We're running down out of time, so if, Paul, you have any quick thoughts on that, it seems like you know a lot about your electric vehicles. Very quick. <laughs> I hate to be a Tesla fanboy, but... Um, one of the reasons I like tes Tesla is because they are at the cutting edge of innovation. They have the, um, no, no electric vehicles out there can beat Tesla for its, uh, its um, battery range and its efficiency, its aerodynamics. You get um, more range per battery with a Tesla car than any other car. And here's an example with a, with a, 75 kilowatt hour battery in a Tesla Model 3, you can go 325 miles. With a 75 kilowatt hour battery in one of the new Mercedes um, electric cars, you can go 150 miles. Um, there's uh, the Rivian uh, electric vehicle. Uh, they've got a pickup truck and an SUV they're coming out with in the next couple of years. They have a 150 kilowatt hour battery that allows them to go 400 miles. What they There's no aerodynamics in their car, so they just packed in double the amount of batteries that you get in a Tesla car to go the same range. So um, just do some homework do some research and watch um, how the technology is changing. I would definitely get a new car because the technology is changing so rapidly. You're going to get a lot more range for less money uh, in a new car than you would uh, a car three or four or five years ago. I was just going to add uh, real quick. If you're not worried about range and the latest thing, we do keep hearing that there's amazing deals on used, like a used Nissan Leaf and things like that. Like if you just want to try it out and get into it, or you have a short, short commute, you know, home to school or home to office or whatever, 
um, and you're looking for the low end of the price range, what people are saying is these, uh, you know, one or two year old um, uh, EVs are uh, unbelievably good deals. So that's another, it really depends on what you're looking for and, and what you need to get out of your car. So I'm just gonna add that comment. Thanks, Anya. And I have a question from Larry on a different note. So I'll let anyone on the panel who has some knowledge on this technology to give us the answer. We have from Larry, he said, Morocco, which uses parabolic collectors to generate heat to power turbines and excess heat is stored in salt tanks. Is this advanced technology being used in the US yet? Yes. Uh, we have, we have so they're called solar thermal plants. They're solar photovoltaics that we've been talking about, solar panels and the light shines on it and it creates electrons. What that technology is that the questioner asked about is solar thermal technology. And it's, it's kind of old school. It's a, it's a steam plant. It, it boils water under a high pressure and spins a turbine with steam. Um, we've got two or three in the Southwest, at least two in the Southwest that I'm familiar with, one in Southeastern California. Um, and um, they, were, they were very promising 10 years ago before the cost of solar photovoltaic panels came down so rapidly. And now nobody's building them much anymore because you can get the same amount of energy um, for, uh, for less money um, and less pollution and a lot less water. Uh, with solar photovoltaic panels. So I don't think we're gonna see very many of the solar thermal plants. A few of them will be built, but they consume a lot of energy and they also kill a lot of birds and a lot of insects and a lot of bats. It's a, it's a thermal technology, very similar to the old steam plants. And I think we're moving beyond that. Great, thank you for your insight, Paul. We have a question from Mac that says, why is vehicle to grid taking so long to implement? Corey, do you have any insight on that? I would, I would certainly uh, defer to uh, Paul for any sort of um, uh, specific answer here, but I think a lot of it comes down just to the, the policies of working with existing assets that you've paid for to do one thing, in other words, transportation, and then repurposing them for something else, right? You're, you have two, two masters, so to speak, and working through that, I think, is really the, the challenge, um, as well as probably some issues with financing and scale of sort of controlling those units together, which is uh, still sort of in development. But uh, Paul, what would you uh, say to that? No, you got it. Um, I would just say it's coming. I mean, we have to develop the technologies to do vehicle to grid, and then they have to be tested. And then the utilities have to come up with policies about how to integrate them and utilize them. Then the regulatory commissions have to come up with how do we value that resource and pay people for the use of their batteries. So there's a whole lot of innovation that has to be laid out and tested and modeled, et cetera. Um, it is coming and everybody's working on it and it will be widespread in five years. Um, we'll look back at it and we'll say, wow, that was quick. But while we're in it and we see the potential for that technology, it's a little frustrating. It seems like so I think in hindsight, in a few years, we'll look back and we'll say, OK, well, we uh, we, you know, we, we finally got around to it pretty quickly, I, I think, looking back on it. Now I'm rambling. Thank you, Paul. Let's wrap it up. Um, Anya, I have a quick question for you. Um, the solar revolution, this is from Zach in Indiana. The solar revolution is obviously changing fast. What are some important updates since the film was released or updates that you have since 2018 to give folks as we wrap up this q and You know, the thing that jumped out at me the most uh, that it changed is um, it's how fast it's going, how fast the cost is dropping. And uh, there, there was a bunch of prices in there. And I was like, oh, my God, it's so much cheaper now. And uh, Paul had made the point, solar is competitive in a, in, a, in a competitive auction where the game is fair, right, where it's not rigged and the regulators are making it a fair competition. Solar plus storage is beating natural gas right now. And that it's a total game changer. So, and then these virtual power plants that we already spent a lot of time on. So it's just the speed at which it's becoming 
the obvious choice and staying in conventional energy is becoming the risky choice. And I think that that, you know, that's 18 months since that, you know, thinking has flipped like that. So it's, it's really exciting to see, um, to see that transformation. And then um, I guess the only other thing I would add is just more and more people across the country are really coming to the realization that they can make this power themselves. It's cleaner. It's bringing benefit to the local, their local communities. Uh, it's cheaper. Um, they have control over it. They can keep the lights on when the power goes out. And sort of the realization, that empowerment that comes from sort of getting to that point is so exciting. And I think we're just very close to reaching critical mass in a lot of places on that. Thank you, Anya, and thank you to our panelists tonight, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we have some other exciting virtual opportunities that will be coming through Solar United Neighbors, so keep your eyes out for your email, and we'll keep you in the loop about things coming up. If you have any other questions, please reach out to us um, through getinvolved.solarunitedneighbors.org or check out our website, solarunitedneighbors.org, or connect with us on social media. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and stay healthy. Thank you all. Thank you.